geophysics is the study in physics of the Earth and its environment in space. Geophysics mainly includes studies of the Earth's shape, gravitational field, magnetic field, internal structure, internal composition, plate tectonics, generation of magma, volcanism, and rock formation. However, Sometimes it includes the hydrological cycle, fluid dynamics of the oceans and the atmosphere, electricity and magnetism in the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, solar terrestrial interactions, and similar problems on the moon and other planets. Geophysics at its heart is the application of the principles of physics to the Earth in the more recent years of the planetary body. As we expand our knowledge of worlds other than the Earth, this expansion is natural. However, it is really only cultural inertia within the scientific community that keeps it from being changed to planetary physics. Gravimetry is the measurement of gravitational field strength. There are factors that affect the local gravitational field. They include the density of the material under the spot on the planet and other nearby objects. On Earth, the major factor from other objects in space are the moon and the sun. Plate tectonics produces some variation in local underground density, as does mineral composition and other factors. These factors make gravimetry useful in studying the Earth's interior. It is also useful in hunting for specific minerals, since different minerals have different densities. Geothermal physics is the study of heat flow within the Earth and its effects on the Earth. This is being extended to other planets as well. This heat flow is a result of the interior of the Earth slowly cooling. The main source of heat transfer is convection. In the mantle, some heat is transferred by mantle plumes. The other main source of heat transfer is conduction at the core mantle boundary and in the lithiosphere. The convections in the mantle drive plate tectonics. The Earth's interior loses heat to the surface at a rate of 42 trillion watts. This is a considerable amount of heat, making geothermal energy a safe and plentiful source of energy. Geoelectromagnetics is the study of the flow of electricity in the Earth and other planetary atmospheres. This includes lightning as well as the regular flow of electricity from the Earth's surface into the atmosphere. Because of ionization in the Earth's atmosphere, caused mainly by cosmic rays, the Earth's atmosphere has a net excess positive charge relative to the surface. This electrical imbalance results in a normal charge of about 150 volts per meter and is associated with fair weather ionic drift current. However, this potential gets as high as 100,000 volts per meter in thunderstorms before a lightning strike. Geoelectromagnetics also includes the interactions of these currents and ions with the geomagnetic field. It also includes electromagnetic waves produced in both the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth itself. Geophysical fluid dynamics is the study of the motion and interactions of all the fluids on and within the Earth and other planetary bodies. In the Earth, these fluids include the magnetosphere, the atmosphere, the oceans, the mantle, and the outer core. Mineral physics is the study of the minerals that compose the interior of the Earth and other planets. Specifically, it is the study of how these minerals react under the temperatures and pressures found within a planet. Understanding the size, form, and structure of the Earth is important to understanding how various forces affect the planet. The Earth has a mass of about 5.97219 times 10 to the 24th power kilograms and an average radius of about 6,378.1 kilometers. The Earth is not a perfect sphere because it bulges slightly at the equator due to its rotation. At the equator, the Earth has a radius of 6,378.137 kilometers. At the poles, the Earth has a radius of 6,356.7523 kilometers. The deep interior of the Earth has never been directly observed. However, its structure can be deduced from seismology and other factors. There is a solid crust which forms the surface on which we live. There are two parts to the crust, the continental crust and the oceanic crust. The oceanic crust is a relatively thin basalt layer about three miles thick. The continental crust essentially consists of sediment-covered granite slabs that go to an average depth of 22 miles or 35 kilometers, forming deep foundations. The mantle is a solid, but due to the high pressure and temperatures at those depths, it is semi-fluid, allowing it to slowly flow. The liquid outer core is the area that produces the Earth's magnetic field by way of electric current. The solid, largely iron inner core is under such high pressure that even at such high temperatures, it is still solid. Radioactivity, also called nuclear decay, 
is the phenomenon whereby an unstable atomic nucleus emits ionizing radiation causing the nucleus to lose energy and rest mass. Radioactivity causes about 80% of the Earth's internal heat, with the main isotopes being potassium-40, uranium-238, uranium-235, and thorium-232. While there are many types of nuclear decay, there are two main ones found in nature, alpha decay and negative beta decay. In alpha decay, the nucleus ejects an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a helium atomic nucleus consisting of two protons and two neutrons. The process reduces the atomic number of the atom by two, changing the element. In negative beta decay, a neutron emits a beta particle and an electron antineutrino to become a proton. Beta particles are actually negatively charged electrons. This process increases the atomic number of the nucleus by one, turning it into a different element. For collections of radioactive nuclei, there is a characteristic decay rate. The decay rate is usually designated by the isotope's half-life, which is the time needed for half of the isotope to decay. This half-life is independent of the amount of the parent isotope. Here is a video illustration of the decay of a radioactive sample. Note that the more atoms of the parent isotope there are, the more nuclei will decay in a given unit of time. This is why the half-life is independent of the amount of the parent isotope. Nuclear decay is often used in determining the age of a sample. However, there are assumptions involved in the process. It is especially assumed that the half-life of an isotope is constant. Accelerated nuclear decay is the process by which nuclear decay proceeds at a faster rate than normal. Small amounts of accelerated nuclear decay have been observed in beta decay under some circumstances. While accelerated alpha decay has never been directly observed, evidence for it does exist in the retention of radiogenic helium by zircon crystals. Accelerated nuclear decay would look identical to normal decay, but faster. For example, here is our earlier video illustration at its normal rate. Here is the same decay process accelerated by a factor of 2. The main argument against the hypothesis that the retention of radiogenic helium by zircon crystals shows substantial alpha decay is heat. The other common argument is the lack of an observed cause of accelerated alpha decay. However, there are theoretical answers to both. The real reason for resistance to the hypothesis that the retention of radiogenic helium by zircon crystals shows substantial accelerated alpha decay is the fact that it would drastically reduce radiometric ages. However, none of these arguments change the fact that measured helium diffusion rates in zircon crystals are a perfect match to a model showing accelerated alpha decay about 6,000 years ago. Seismology is the science that studies earthquakes and the propagation of electric waves through the Earth and through other planetary bodies. On Earth, the elastic waves are often the result of earthquakes. Earthquakes are the effect of a sudden release of energy in the Earth's crust, creating seismic waves. The strength of an earthquake is measured by a base 10 logarithmic scale called the Richter scale. There are three main types of seismic waves. Body waves, which travel through the Earth. Surface waves, which travel through the Earth's crust in normal modes that ring the Earth like a bell. Seismic waves have been used to map the interior of the Earth. This works because the waves travel at different speeds as the density and composition change. The Earth's crust is divided into segments called plates. Now these plates are not fixed, but they slowly move over the mantle. Now when these plates meet, they interact. And they interact in three main ways, sliding, spreading, and subduction, which is seen as the driving mechanism of plate tectonics. When these plates interact, the results are earthquakes and volcanoes. Plate tectonics got its start in a book published by Antonio Snyder 
Pellegrini in 1859 called La Creation et es Mysteries de, de Voice, which is translated The Creation and Its Mysteries Unveiled. He proposed that all of the continents were once connected together based on discovering the same plant fossils in both Europe and the United States. He then found this fossil matching on all of the continents. He proposed that the supercontinent catastrophically broke up, resulting in the flood described in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The catastrophic nature of the process went against uniformitarianism, and so this early version of plate tectonics got little support at the time. This image is from the book, The Creation and Its Mysteries Unveiled. It shows the continent before and after separation. The idea of plate tectonics was later picked up by Alfred Wagner around 1910. He slowed down Antonio Snyder's catastrophic plate tectonics to make it fit evolutionary time scale, producing continental drift. This slowed down version of plate tectonics became an establishment theory around 1963. However, catastrophic plate tectonics was revived by Dr. John Bungardner in the 1990s. He supports the concept with computer modeling of the Earth's interior. The result is a scientific description of the Genesis flood. Modern catastrophic plate tectonics is basically plate tectonics on overdrive. Geomagnetism is the study of the Earth's magnetic field. It includes the study of the magnetic fields of other planetary bodies as well. The Earth's magnetic field is tilted about 11 degrees relative to its rotational axis. And the present magnitude of the Earth's magnetic field at the Earth's surface ranges from 0.25 to 0.65 Gauss. The Earth's magnetic field is produced by an electric current in the core. However, measurements since 1900 have shown a net loss of field energy of about 5%, which is equivalent to a half-life of 1,465 years. The dominant model used to solve this problem is called the dynamo field. The idea is that the current that produces planetary magnetic fields is generated by a self-sustaining dynamo powered by the planet's spin. The result is complex currents in the planet's core that causes the field to fluctuate and from time to time reversing itself. In the case of the Earth, it is thought to occur about every 500 to 700,000 years. The theory is illustrated in this manner. Dark areas represent present magnetic field direction, and light areas show reverse magnetic field direction. It shows nice neat stripes across the ocean floor as produced by the theory. In reality, the pattern is not so neat and regular. The tendency is for the positive and negative areas to be mixed up, and this is the case all over the world. It gets worse when you look vertically, but the negative and positive are one on top of the other. Actual data seems to be inconsistent with uniformitarian theory, but consistent with a rapid spreading coupled with rapid magnetic reversal, a stretching with cracking, and a single reversal, temporary local magnetic reversals, or reversals resulting from stress in the rock. There are other problems with the dynamo theory, and they include life will periodically be exposed to deadly solar radiation. It cannot explain the existence of the magnetic field of Mercury. It rotates too slowly to have a self-sustaining dynamo, and so it should not have a magnetic field. Furthermore, Mercury's magnetic field is decaying, and quite rapidly. It cannot explain the orientation of the magnetic field of Uranus and Neptune. The magnetic axis of each planet is tilted about 60 degrees with respect to the rotation axis, so that the magnetic poles are nearly at the equator. Furthermore, the source of the planet's magnetic field is offset from the center by about one-third of a planetary radius. According to the dynamo theory, the magnetic and rotational axes should be nearly always closely aligned. Dynamic decay theory was developed by Dr. Russell Humphrey, a physicist at the Institute for Creation Research. He uses an alignment of the magnetic field of the planet's molecules to jumpstart the planet's magnetic field. It includes fluctuations and possibly even reversals during and shortly after the Genesis flood, thus explaining the mix-up of the magnetic patterns. Projecting back in time based on magnetic field energy gives a maximum age for the Earth of 8,700 years. Dynamic decay theory explains the origin of planetary and stellar magnetic fields, the orientation of the magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune, both of which are tilted 60 degrees with respect to the rotation axis, and the field source being about one-third of a planet radius offset from the center. It explains the existence of the magnetic field of Mercury since the field source is decaying, and the current in its core cannot be related to spin. 
Measurements by the Messenger spacecraft have confirmed that Mercury's magnetic field is decaying, as predicted by dynamic decay. It explains the residual magnetism on the Moon and Mars, despite the lack of planetary magnetic field. When a planet's magnetic field has sufficient strength, it interacts with solar wind in a manner that forms the magnetosphere. The Earth's magnetic field goes out to about 10 Earth radii in the direction of the Sun. The solar wind is a stream of charged particles. These particles stream out and around the Earth's magnetic field, and they continue behind the Earth, hundreds of Earth radii. Within the magnetosphere exist relatively dense areas of solar wind particles. These relatively dense areas are called the Van Allen radiation belt. This process forms a shield, not only protecting the Earth from normal solar wind, but solar storms as well. Now, observations show that the strength of the Earth's magnetic field is decreasing. As a result, this shield is getting weaker and will one day, in the distant future, disappear. And even if it regenerates itself in a reversal, the life on Earth will be exposed to deadly radiation. One aspect of geophysics that gets little attention for its degree of importance is the recession of the Moon. That's right, the Moon is slowly getting further away and slowing the Earth's rotation in the process. It was first discovered following the Apollo moon landing by bouncing lasers off reflectors left behind by the astronauts. These reflectors were designed to accurately measure the Earth-Moon distance. The results showed that the moon is getting further away at a rate of 1.5 inches or 3.82 centimeters per year. Furthermore, a day is getting longer by 1.7 milliseconds per day per century. This is a backwards projection of the observed slowing of the Earth's rotation and lunar recession day. The current data is simply plugged in to the laws of physics. The result is that the Moon would have been locked in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth around 1.25 billion years ago. This is far short of the 4.533 billion years commonly given for the age of the Earth. This suggests that the Earth-Moon system cannot be anywhere near 4.533 billion years old. The problem is understood by the proponents of a 4.533 billion year old Earth, and several solutions have been proposed. The problem is that pentatological data claimed as evidence for longer days in the past does not fit with any possible model that allows 4.533 billion years. So the ultimate response seems to be that the Earth-Moon system is too complicated to get an accurate result for such calculations. This is essentially admitting that the problem cannot be solved for any Earth-Moon system that is 4.533 billion years old which is exactly what would be the case if the Earth-Moon system were indeed much younger than 4.533 billion years old. Put simply, geophysics is the physics of planetary bodies. It has shown as much about the way our planet, the Earth, works. However, it also raises issues against the claim that the Earth is 4.533 billion years old. 